Okay. We'll go like this. Okay, ready? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Pinot Noir. Um, what do we call it? We call it a night of murder and wine, or whining about murder, whatever you want to say. Um, I took a break um, from this to um, get my life together and get a puppy, uh, as, as you can see. And uh, clearly, it's going well by the look of my room. It's going swimmingly and the bite, all the bite marks on my hands. Um, so, you know, this is Marjean. She did co-host last week, but um, not everybody tuned in to witness that, and I'm so sorry um, for you, really, because it was it was pretty funny. And um, uh, so, so last week, let's just get, last week um, we watched uh, Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt. Oh, oh no, okay. You're okay. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. You almost went over there. Okay. Last week we watched Shadow of a Doubt, right? And um, what Hitchcock movie. And tonight we're going to watch another Hitchcock film, Dial M for Murder. So hold the phone, right? Uh, it answers that great question, can I get away with hiring a man to kill my wife? And um, you can probably figure out what the answer is. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I believe though, uh, I mean, I, well, I'm not really sure. I think this was Hitchcock's 16th film made in America, but don't look at it. I'm probably wrong, right? I, I'm not good at counting. Um, he felt like making this movie actually was a really safe choice at that point in his career. He said he thought that um, he'd already made so many great thrillers that he was like, whatever, this will be a piece of cake because, um, he, he called it coasting. I'm just coasting through my career right now. And, um, but then it turned out to be, you know, one of the greatest and most beloved films he's ever made. And also the first time he worked with Grace Kelly, he shouldn't have been so nonchalant about it because, um, Grace Kelly is an angel um, that was amongst us and they went on to make so many other movies together. Um, so you'll notice while watching this film basically takes place in an apartment. Um, and that is actually because this film was a stage play originally, a very successful stage play that uh, I think had one actually uh, screening on television. And um, so it is a play in that it reads like a play. It's all in one room and like a hallway, you kind of get a glimpse of the outside, but that's how that's, you know, that's the setting for tonight's film. If you haven't already seen it, I do think that this might be one that almost everyone has seen. Uh, and But if not, I, I'm jealous of you, right? I want to rewatch this movie for the first time, you know? Um, but what I, uh, what I think is so great, though, about having, like, this one-room one room movie is how important every object in that room becomes, right? It's like, where is the phone? Please don't eat my knuckles. Thank you. Um, uh, how will that play into the movie? The location of the phone in the room. How much will it matter where the scissors are, you know? Whether or not Grace Kelly took off her stockings on this side of the room or in the bedroom, you know? Everything in the room really matters, and it, it, so it has a lot to do with detail in that way, and um, because the plotting of a murder, you know, cannot be hastily put together. If anything goes wrong, it's like a, you know, a, a sweater unraveling, but, you know, like an ugly sweater, right? Um, and maybe the, I was thinking about it, I was like, this is, this kind of situation is maybe something that today we think, kind of think more, attributes more to like a Coen Brothers type, such, you know, film, the uh, crime gone wrong, but here we get to see Hitchcock take a whack at it, and, um, you know, it doesn't have the humor of Fargo, but it is just as riveting. I, I just love the dialogue in this movie. Um... One thing that you won't realize while uh, watching this movie tonight, possibly on your iPad, or, oh no, don't do that, um, on a computer or your TV, is that this film was actually made in 3D. Um, only, the only film that Hitchcock ever did make in 3D, and not that he wanted to do it, he was made to do it, he had to do it. Um, but WB was like, I'm sorry, 3D is all the rage, it's 1954, so... He had to film it in 3D, which meant that it meant he had to use much bigger cameras um, to try to, you know, whatever those cameras were big. So 
that actually said another part of the cinematography um, is that because he had to use these big cameras, um, he actually built like a lower deck, what is it, like sort of just like this almost basement, if you will, below the set so that he, they could get these like really wide, crazy, like low angles. So in that way that he used this completely different type of um, film style, um, it actually doesn't look like any other Hitchcock film ever. Um, so that's interesting. And even though so it was made in 3D, all this stuff, by the time it came out, 3D had lost its interest. You know, it wasn't, it was really a fad that went by pretty fast. So they shot it in 3D, but actually very few people did ever see it in 3D. Um, so here we watch it in 2D tonight, like most Americans. Um, so the film tonight, so, um, it actually isn't often really described as film noir, but I wanted to include it anyway because I, I for me, I go, this really fits all the noir qual categories, or at, least, or at least, you know, most of them. You know, you've got Grace Kelly, this sort of beautiful, perfect woman, but she has a secret lover, and he's a crime writer who eventually ends up acting as an amateur sleuth, you know, and then her Grace's current husband, who's this calm, cool, collective very nonchalant uh, murder hirer and um, he's out there trying to defy society's rules of I won't get a divorce you know I'll marry I'll kill her for money and and then Grace is here at the center of it and and I'd say yes she's not a typical femme fatale at all right you know she's not directly using her sexuality to control men around her you know she doesn't have this sort of like other angle she's always trying to work on that's like maybe more selfish that you see in a lot of um, femme fatales but she is having an affair. So I just think that she actually does use her own, she is powerful in that way. Like in 19, in the fifties, that's a big no, no having an affair. So I think that there is actually more to be said for the power of her character. And um, so she's not a femme fatale, but you know, I don't think she's a helpless woman though. It's there are points of the movie where she really looks like she's helpless. Um, so this story, um, I mean, it might it might not feel new, right? The, it's kind of a classic Kill Your Wife movie, but I mean, maybe you've actually seen its remake. Um, a little movie with Michael Douglas and Gwyneth Paltrow called A Perfect Murder. Um, and if that, and so maybe it all sounds a little bit familiar, but you didn't see it with Greg, Grace Kelly. And these all these actors are so, it's just such a wonderfully rich film. Um, it's, you've got Grace Kelly, Ray Milland, Robert Cummings, and then two really great character actors, Dan uh, Anthony Dawson and John Williams, who I really love. Um, so you're going to have fun tonight. Margie, will she watch it? We don't know. Um, and especially uh, Grace Kelly's outfits, right? This is my most uh, Grace Kelly looking piece that I own um, that I barely fit into because of COVID, right? Um, she's got great outfits. She also has a really great handbag that's a big part of the movie, and I feel like there's, I think I got, I get ASMR from this handbag and the way that it's opened and closed. Um, so, we will see you after. Please enjoy the film. Have a glass of wine. We don't care what type it is. Frank sends his suggestions, and that's what they are, suggestions. You drink what you want. Um, okay, so Margie, do you have anything to say? No. Yes? Okay. All right. That's it. We will see you after. Bye.